Okay. All right, then. Let's begin. People will keep filing in, I think, but I want to get started because we have a lot to do and a lot to say and see. So I am B. Ruby Rich. I'm the editor of Film Quarterly, and it's a delight to be here today with this crowd. Um, I can explain what brought us together after, but right now I want to get going so you can see the remarkable uh, video uh, installation view of the exhibition that is up now at the McAvoy Fine Arts Space. And um, I want to let uh, Susan Miller have a word to welcome you too before we go to the video. Susan? Thank you, Ruby. Um, hi, my name is Susan Miller, and I'm the executive director of McAvoy Foundation for the Arts. Thank you all for joining us for the special conversation. Uh, we're so pleased to be partnering with Film Quarterly um, on, uh, and, and to have this conversation about Isaac Julian's Lessons of the Hour, Frederick Douglass. It's a fantastic work, a 10 channel piece on view in our space in San Francisco until mid-March, 2021. We didn't intended to open the show last summer, but that pesky virus got in the way. So we're, we're gonna run it now for six months and um, we hope you all can make it. Uh, check it out on our website at mcavoyarts.org. Uh, the exhibition is joined by a host of related conversations, film screenings and gallery exhibitions with many, many partners locally, nationally and internationally. On November 11th, Angela Davis will join Isaac and Douglas scholar, Sarah Lewis uh, for a conversation at 6 p.m. with the San Francisco Public Library and the Museum of African Diaspora. And these are all available to you for free. The exhibition space is free and open to the public. Um, and I hope you can make it by if we ever uh, get back on the road again. Um, just a few very brief acknowledgements. I'd like to thank Ruby, Kaz and Warren and Isaac, um, especially. A special shout out to Jennifer Gonzalez at UC Santa Cruz, Mark Nash, Leela Weifer, um, and the UC Santa Cruz itself, uh, the staff and crew at Film Quarterly and McAvoy Arts, and finally to Nyan McAvoy, his family, and Leslie Berriman for making this all possible. Back to you, Ruby. Thanks so much, Susan. And um, I'll do further greetings after, but let's segue now um, to a six minute piece that will take us through the installation at McAvoy, and so that you can all see what it is we are talking about, this extraordinary work. Um, lessons of the hour, uh, let's have it. And in the still darkness of midnight, I have often been aroused by the dead heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chain gangs that passed our door. What to the American slave is your fourth of July? I answer. A day that reveals to him more than all the other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, his celebration is a sham. He boasted liberty an unholy license. Your nation's greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Prayers and your hymns, your sermons and your thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil cover up crimes, 
but you'll disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than all the people in these United States in this very hour. I have now my manumission papers in my possession. There is nothing that will sting the Americans more than the fact I left Republican America a slave. I returned from monarchical England a free man. Okay. We cut that a little bit short to have more time to talk, but I think that gives a phenomenal overview of what this piece is. So uh, w let me explain how we're going to run this event. Um, we're going to hear first from Warren and Kaz, who wrote the fantastic article for us for Film Quarterly, A Grand Panorama, Isaac Julian, Frederick Douglass, and Lessons of the Hour that we published this summer to mark this exhibition. And um, then we're going to hear from Isaac. Each person's gonna speak five to seven minutes and we're then going to come together and all four of us have a round table conversation about this piece, after which we're gonna open it up to your questions, the comments you're putting in the chat or in the Q&A and really allow you to have some input into what more you wanna hear about. So to get started, I'm gonna ask you Warren Critchlow, up at York University in Toronto, co-author of this piece. If you want to share um, some of the highlights of your thinking on this now, over over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Ruby. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be here and to to talk about this uh, this uh, this work, this wonderful work. Uh, that sequence that you showed is is so fantastic. Uh, I've been thinking about it uh, quite a lot. I don't know if it was fully visible uh, to the audience, uh, but there's so many striking things in that last three or four minutes of the, of the installation. Um, and particularly one of the things that most strikes me, it's, it's, it's very, it's so subtle um, that uh, in that sequence, there is a uh, kind of full masted schooner that uh, migrates across the 10 screens from left to right uh, I believe, and um, it signals so many things. That's uh, the schooner just migrating across the the screens as uh, the as uh, there's the reenactment of the Fourth of July uh, speech, and it, it speaks to so many things. I I think that are that are so present, uh, both directly and indirectly in the in the installation, uh, particularly the location of that that scene in uh with the with the schooner in baltimore uh a place from which uh douglas uh escaped uh, as a slave to his freedom uh, and uh to which the installation itself returns in such an interesting way uh with the the freddie gray verdict uh you know a century or more later uh as it were um, and so it, all of these uh, elements that are operating, I, I think, in, this, in that sequence are particularly uh, gripping in, in their presentation, in their aesthetics, 
in the architecture of the, of the 10 screens. Um, I've been particularly struck, um, in fact, by that uh, transition moment uh, where um, you know, Douglas uh, completes the, 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 you know, the speech. And uh, there's that kind of um, fragility uh, and, and a kind of doubt that, um, that Isaac captures in that moment where he's <clears throat> so forceful and direct um, in this very hour. Uh, which so speaks to the to the present moment uh, in which we live, uh, this very hour, uh, a week from the the presidential election that that means so much uh, in terms of the, the the last terrible four years and the possibility of the next four years. This very hour, the both the domestic and the the sort of international reach of of that of that of that moment. It. it you know, it, it couldn't have happened. It couldn't have happened at a at a, a more significant time for us to to be provoked. Uh, so much there. Um, I'm also struck by uh, the the ending of that, where the the screens all go to 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 black, uh, to to black water, and that's such an interesting kind of phrase, black water, at least in the African American uh, idiom, um, and also the way in which we didn't quite get to the to the end of this but of course Douglas uh, ends this sequence with uh, reference to his his uh, manumission uh, he's returned from uh, of, um, you know a, a time of, of um, exile as a fugitive in the in the UK and he's now returned uh, from uh, Republican from Republican uh, monarchical England to Republican America, uh, a, a freed, a freed man, and there's there's so much about the you know the the contradictions and the the slippages uh, in which those two terms, Republican and monarchical, uh, operate. Uh, quite astounding moment. But what captures my attention more in that moment, uh, the the last thirty or forty seconds of that, you know, my background uh, in a certain way captures this peripatetic uh, walk of Douglas and, and the stallion uh, through this, this uh, you know, this very interesting, uh, this very interesting landscape, uh, which is uh, perhaps Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, Douglas is thinking, uh, thinking very, Deeply, he's in this kind of meditation, and he has this kind of stallion as a as a companion, a horse. And if we read the 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 uh, first Douglas narrative, he says so much about horses that is, I, I think, resonant here and captured here in a in a quite different way, not a didactic way, but in a way that I think that is really quite provocative of 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 Douglas's own writing and that history, and and the very present moment. I understand that there are uh, in Los Angeles and elsewhere, Philadelphia uh, people are riding horses to <laughs> to the voting stations in a in a particular way in 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 black communities in these cities. So it's quite astounding what the, the connections and the uh, the synergies that are going on here. So I've been quite struck, in fact, by this just this last minute or two of the installation. I've gone back into Douglas's. Uh, uh, Douglas's uh, narratives, his autobiographies, to read about this relationship uh, between uh, himself and and the animal, and the way in which this, uh, in fact, constructs a certain kind of philosophical engagement that Douglas was uh, involved in and thinking through about the very question of of the human and the construction of of a, you know a certain kind of universal humanity that is uh, you know organized around this relationship between the you know the, the human and the and the animal I think all of this is not direct and this I think is the beauty and the marvel of of of, of Isaac's work and this particular work lessons of of the hour that it both uh, contemporizes uh, Douglas at this particular moment this important moment of time and also um, uh, provokes us 
to not only think about Douglas, but to think more about the significance of, of Douglas and his life and his work, his unfinished project, in fact, um, in, in the present moment. And so it's much more to say about this, but it's entirely a rich um, and provocative um, and thought provoking uh, work I find. And um, I, I was so uh, struck by doing the work of trying to write the piece with, with Cass Banning on this and the kind of research and thinking that we were able to do together on it. So uh, I think I'll stop there and see what, uh, see what Cass has to say. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Warren. And Kaz, um, I'm really delighted to have you here. Um, Kaz Banding is at the University of Toronto, and her bio will be showing up in the side in the chat the same way that Warren's just has. But um, they are co-authors of this article, and uh, we couldn't be prouder to have it in Film Quarterly. So over to you, Kaz. Thank you, Ruby. And I thank you for um, setting it up that we could respond to this amazing work. And also thank you, uh, Susan, for inviting us. This is an amazing setup. I'm really honored to be in such esteemed company, but especially the events coming up. And of course, what a joy to be able to uh, be in conversation with yourself and Isaac. Um, what to say? Um, I think that our piece just touches the iceberg of so many things you could talk about. We just, um, sorry, I shouldn't talk with my hands, which I always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just, it, it, it's such, an, a rich, such a rich and compelling piece. And to think that it was conceptualized, um, when did it come out? The spring of 2019, I think. Is that what, it, 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 I think that was it, the spring of 2019. Um, the original piece, both, yeah, because the article came out in this summer. Yeah, and um, we wrote it before um, the turmoil and, and Floyd's death, whatever, but I mean, it was prescient before the events of the last six months. Um, it's just phenomenal how it does speak um, to, to our moment. Um, well, what can I say? A few things. It's all in the piece. I understand Ruby is going to post it. Is that correct? That's right. We'll post this at the end so everyone can read it. We're going to take away. <laughs> um, so um, having seen the work once again, so I thought about it and I hadn't really, we hadn't really explored this in um, the piece that we wrote together. Um, and I was thinking about alignments. I mean, not to make a crude correspondence, but the alignments between um, Isaac's practice, um, how, it's, how his thoughts are realized visually, and the words of um, Frederick Douglass himself, which indeed, that's one of the, a very, the way it's structured, it's a form of direct address. That's what we hear, mostly, except for letters from the two uh, sisters, but we hear direct address. He's speaking directly to us. And having uh, been forced as, as not, not, I'm not a Douglas scholar, not forced, I had to do some research and um, I just was reminded of the selectivity, what was selected um, was, is frankly profound and, how, and what the piece does with those words. Um, Alignments. Of course, the key tropes in this are perspective, spectatorship, framing. But I just want to read a line um, from when Douglas is speaking in this marvelous space at the Royal Academy of Art. That's what you see in the clip, um, particularly if this is the Benjamin West Theater, um, where you have um, figures from Douglas's life. Um, Anna Marie Douglas, Helen Pitts, uh, Aurelie Asting, um, uh, other figures as well, co-mingling with contemporaneous spectators, um, be it Catherine Hall, uh, be it uh, a collaborator with Isaac, uh, Mark Nash, etc. So I just want to stress that this isn't just a kind of a conceit, like a play with past, present temporality, especially when you think of um, where this is located. 
right, in the august halls of the Royal Academy of Art, having these people speak, sit together across centuries. But I just want to read um, this line that comes at the beginning, and these are Douglas's words in the, in, the, in the piece. Pictures like songs should be left to make their own into the world. All they can reasonably ask of us is that we place them on the wall in the best possible light, and for the rest, allow them to speak for themselves. And in a way, uh, sorry, I have to stop talking with my hands. This I see as um, Isaac's practice. He could have, that's what he's done. So there's a correspondence between Douglas and um, Isaac's thoughts. And also when he begins um, his speech, he's up at the lectern and he says something to the effect, he's astonished and grateful for standing in that particular space. And again, I thought, again, there was a kind of biographical flourish. Um, how long have I talked? I mean, there's so many things to talk about. I'm fine. I'm interested in, um, well, because of my training, I'm interested in the relationship, of course, um, between aesthetics and politics. And of course, how the aesthetics in this piece, piece work against having a hagiographic um, portrait of this wonder, amazing individual. And how, how does that, how is that worried? Well, coming at um, Douglas from many, many angles, thanks to the affordances of multi-screen aesthetics, but I'm sure Isaac will want to talk to that as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, we, I, we can read this in the piece. Um, I, I, we tease out some of the key signature effects that not only in this piece, but we argue throughout his career. And one of them in particular that has always interested me around um, Isaac's practice is indeed the mobilization of the tableau, the tableau effect, and how multi screen work in and itself plays with this notion of. You could call the oxymoron, the notion of the still, and the movement. Movement, and so these ideas of progress that um, Douglas was in, indeed celebrating, um, are and movement, etc., are broken up, if you will, by these moments of stasis um, that allow us to slow down and be more and be contemplative, which his Isaac, his work in particular, affords. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Yeah, there's so many things, signature effects that we teased out. Of course, the tableau, um, the ambulatory um, movement, right? These the figures, be it um, Langston Hughes, be it Franz Fanon, be it True North, uh, sorry, Matthew Henson. And one thing about having the privilege of, of observing, engaging with, teaching, um, thinking about Isaac's work is that it's always a sense of, anticipation, like, okay, what's he going to do with Franz Fanon, right? How, what's he going to do with Franz Fanon? Um, and of course, the amount of research, of course, is was structured around the gaze. And this work, you know, there's a shift, not necessarily, that's always been a key um, concern in all of Isaac's works, the gaze, but there's something here, there's a shift to thinking about perception in a wider frame, right? It's talking about embodied uh, perception, perception, et cetera. So again, to, to how do you come at such a you know, renowned figure in American letters, history, et cetera? And how do you not make a linear trajectory? How do you not, he did this, he did this, he did this? No, the focus is on consciousness, right? On him coming into being, or you could say becoming Frederick Douglass, or becoming human in a you know not in a in an ontological way. Anyway, it's, I just um, I'm, unfortunately because of COVID, you all can't see this work, but um, thank you, Isaac, for once again thrilling us. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kaz, for that. Um, Isaac, I'm going to turn the floor over to you for what you feel like saying today about this work, this installation, 
uh, the article that Kaz and Warren have done or your current thoughts on any part of this. You know, great to have you here. It's all yours. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, um, Ruby. And also, I'm incredibly grateful for um, having this opportunity. I was incredibly moved by Warren and Kaz's article. And I want to thank um, Ruby so much for publishing it. It's quite an honor to have this um, published in from quarterly on the occasion of the show opening at the McAvoy Foundation. And I also want to um, thank the McAvoy Foundation for doing such a stunning installation. And also to um, say that um, I think one of the things for me in relationship to this work um, and it in a way showing now, which is of course incredibly important, is the way in which the original impetus for this work came from actually a curator, Don Hanhart, who actually commissioned me to make a work. And it's very seldom really in my career where I'm actually commissioned to make works. And it was the journey to Rochester and to see Frederick Douglass's statue in Highland Park um, actually next to Goethe, um, which is also incredibly interesting, and to begin to explore through respect to many scholars, you know, and I think this is obviously one of the reasons why I'm here at Santa Cruz now, is to do, university, is to do with really the scholarship that has been done on Douglas's work. And if I think about the amazing essay that um, Henry Louis Gates wrote about Douglas and photography, this only in a way instilled me more or created my curiosity to really delve into Douglas in relationship to his life. Because not only was he an amazing orator and writer, um, and the fact that he had spent the best part of 21 months living in Scotland as a fugitive slave after he had published his autobiography, um, that you know, he became so successful, he was really scared he'd be re-enslaved. There was also this interest in photography that he'd written about this um, technology 70 years before Benjamin. And I mean, I didn't know that, you know, I mean, that for me was a revelation. And also to find out he was the most photographed man of the 19th century. I didn't know that. I don't think people really know that. And I think there's something about Douglas and the way in which his words just are so important for how we think about ourselves now in relationship to all of the various struggles. When I was making the work, it was with the help of Celeste Barnier, the amazing art historian and scholar and the pulling together with my whole team, you know, I, I working with the amazing cinematographer, Nina Carlgren, for example, who shot Looking for Langston. It was this nexus between photography and if you like human rights, which twinned a kind of energy um, to try to make a work that would somehow move Douglas into the 21st century. Because to a certain extent, he is someone that has an incredibly future orientated way of thinking about humanity. Um, and of course, it's a transnational aspect of Douglas and the way in which being both in America and the movement to Scotland and what he found in Scotland, enlightenment, which then would turn him into this sort of figure where he would be able to, in a way, broach the subjects in this incredible manner, which still resonate to this very day. And so for me, um, everybody who worked on the project got completely in fraud. You know, the art director, the costume designer, um, just bringing together all of the kind of nuances that we needed to construct both the image of Douglas along with our kind of historical kind of research that we had undertaken and then being able to bring together this kind of um, interest that Douglas also had in Shakespeare, for example, and having someone like Roy Theron, 
who is an RSC actor, Royal Shakespeare Company actor, um, who recognized straight away the kind of Shakespearean motifs in Douglas's writing. And to bring those together in a way that could cut across time. Um, and so bringing together all of the voices, you know, both from the past in terms of Susan B. Ante, Ottilin Assin, um, suffragette movement figures, along with people from today, Catherine Hall, who has lead, been leading the way for the abolition consciousness around slavery in Britain, um, and really bringing all of those people into the space where he gives these lectures, which span, you know, several years of Douglas's life, and to intersperse those in this kind of panoramic effect, you know, and it's his relationship to his philosophy around photography and the ways in which he was able to, in a sense, use his self image and to propel that through the technology around a certain, a way that would be able to somehow do the work, which was, you know, in a way, the reparation work um, to try to, yes, to, to try to um, bring into core the shameful stereotypical caricatures which were being made of African-Americans at that particular time. You know, so I feel that, you know, there are so many things in Douglas which are so important in terms of making the work, you know, and it, it just propels one, you know, and then in terms of the 10 screen approach, I mean, of course, that was very much inspired by the 19th century Salon Hang in terms of paintings. If you go to the Royal Academy today, to the summer show, <laughs> you will see that these paintings still hung like this. <laughs> um, in, and in a way, one could have fun in terms of this panoramic vision of the Salon Hang with the screens, um, playing with time and temporality and in a way being able to work in this kind of visual notational sense where we could have images um, where, for example, you know, you would have the main speech, but then you would have these associative images where you could see the speech, of course, articulated in the 19th century um, side by side with what took place in the 21st century with the Freddie Gray demonstrations, you know, with the whole ways in which um, this FBI footage um, by drones, this mechanical technological eye on the black public who are kind of expressing themselves through protests against this terrible killing of Freddie Gray, which of course echoes what we have today in terms of Black Lives Matter movement and the terrible, terrible um, sort of murder um, the George Floyd that we saw. And in a way we can see across this time period in this election, how, you know, how incredible, um, you know, the, the racist discourse of interpolation is still utilized, you know, by, you know, sectors of its kind of white Republican public as a body politic, you know. So I think there are all of these aspects which were resonating in making the work. And of course, it's through this sort of aesthetic agenda that I want to try to make a sort of visual, if you like, argument in a kind of poetic way where we can try to come to grips with this incredible mind, you know, of Douglas. And to Isaac, I think this is the perfect spot to get you to segue to letting people see some of the installation slides that you've brought along. Do you want to do that and, and narrate them a bit as we go through them? Oh, that'd be wonderful. So here we have, you know, the installation view at McAvoy. As I said, it's a 10 screen installation. And we have Atin Ossin here on the left by the side of Douglas, and you can see his interest in tintypes and photogravures. And there's a way in which in this scene, 
I'm really interested in setting up, you know, this relationship between technology and, um, if you like, um, humanity. And here we have another view um, of a tin type, which actually is processed in the making of the scene um, during the Douglas speech, when he is discussing about um, the aesthetics of photography and how it's going to, how he views it as this reparational tour um, for self-representation, um, but how, of course, we're all involved in this liberatory um, possibility at this particular moment in time where photography um, can be presented as a portrait for every household. And so there's a way in which sort of these questions um, oscillate between technology and nature and landscape. This is a moment where Douglas, who also was very much um, in relationship um, to observing Quakerism, the idea of taking silence and being in unison with nature, which I think, um, you know, from, you could say, an, a more narrow abolitionist to a profane universalism, his increasing concern with the implications of perceiving humanity in a common as a single species united by folly and its vulnerability and the relationship to landscape. Um, of course, slaves worked very closely to the land, you know, um, and this question then of how he strives and becomes part of the free church movement in Scotland, where he leads a very successful campaign, um, embellishes these images, and we have a representation of um, the Richardson sisters who were involved in um, fundraising for his freedom, um, and they etch out, save, send back the money. I mean, there's a certain perfect artistic license taken here. <laughs> I don't know if the Richardson's really did this, <laughs> but it's really the twinning together of all of these concerns around um, suffrage, um, abolitionism, which was a great cause in the north of England and in Scotland in particular, where Douglas lived. And here we have the kind of um, another view of the McAvoy installation, which I have to say has been installed immaculately by them where we have, as it were, Douglas on top of the mountain, so to speak, there um, at Arthur's um, seat, and he's looking out onto the horizon. And of course, there's the references to Caspar David Friedrich, but there's also um, the representation um, in this finale to his relationship to um, um, seeing humanity as a common single species united by its folly and its vulnerability in relationship to the horse um, and his thoughts about animals um, and the fact that he would return back to um, America um, as a free subject. And here we have the gallery sequence where we have photographs, we have um, North Star to the far, um, Lady of the Lake to the right, where Anna Murray, who wasn't photographed, of course, as much as Douglas, but in my work, what I've tried to do is to foreground Anna Douglas and to really try um, to reframe her image. You know, um, here we have an image of the second wife, um, sort of Helen, who was very much. Um, responsible for the legacy of Douglas. If you go to Washington today inside the hill, the home that has been left is very much part of her ambition um, and legacy to preserve his actual house, which we filmed in the beginning of the, in the film. And we were able to, in a way, um, create this sort of very intimate representation of Douglas by um, having access. And here we have the tin types, which um, were made actually on set. And we, um, in a way, in the kind of photographic show, have done a tableau hang of the tin types, 
just to emphasize this relationship between the role of photography as a 19th century um, technology um, and the relationship to Douglas. Douglas was never ever photographed with any um, floral or pictorial representation behind him. It's always with a blank sort of canvas, so to speak. Of course, in my put in types, <laughs> I have sort of tried to put him together with um, J.P. Ball here on the um, right hand side, um, who was the photographer where um, who photographed Douglas, you know, quite often, and they were incredible comrades in struggle, um, working on the Underground Railroad, but also um, J.P. Ball's salon, which is very much featured in the work and recreated, um, I would say astonishingly by um, Derek Brown um, and Nina Calgrin, as a way in which we enter into this whole sort of universe um, of photography that Douglas was a part of. And we have this other view, of course, that shows you Lady of the Lake um, on the right with Anna Murray Douglas and back photograph um, called Rapture, where we have him presented um, with the tree, which of course um, is very synonymous for how he talks about perception in the beginning of the work, where he's basically a child and he's trying to distinguish between the broken black bodies, which are part of the trunks of the tree and the actual tree trunk itself. There's a confusion where he talks about how one looks, the point of view from how one looks is incredibly critical. Um, and this idea of critical looking is what I'm, I've tried to bring in relationship to making the work and how the images syncopate in relationship to one another. And in this image, we have a wonderful exhibition created by Mark Nash of the McAvoy Collection, which um, basically is a history of protests, when life is a protest, as the title of the exhibition, which uses incredible works um, from the McAvoy um, Collection, Martin Luther King, Angela Davis, and here we have an image of Lorraine O'Grady, um, and notice the question around framing and the use of the frame. And this photograph, I hope I don't get killed for being black today by Rudy Roy, which ends this part of the exhibition. And so we can see the timeline here in relationship between Douglas and his call for a certain abolition and how that call still is something which has incredible anxiety for a certain part of the population today. And, you know, I think, you know, for me, it's very moving the ways in which um, we were able to work with that collection and also to connect that to a wonderful program by Leafa Wafer, um, which um, is looking at um, social movements, films made by black and white filmmakers which articulate, I would say, um, some of these questions. I snuck off a slave ship is particularly moving um, by an, um, it's an amazing film, which I would, everybody has to see. It's such an incredible, incredible film. Good, thank you, Isaac. That was fantastic. I think we all really have a feeling of those of us who can't be there of this installation of your process of making it. And thanks uh, Kaz and Warren for everything you've done to frame this work. So I wanna start this more casual conversation between everyone. And I thought I would start by just actually quoting one or two things that you've said at the start of your essay, Kaz and Warren. You say that, um, that, that Isaac Dugan's lessons is less concerned with rendering a hagiographic portrait of Douglas than in reactivating through decidedly haptic and expanded kinesthetic means, his visionary thought as a continued force for human rights in the 21st century. I thought that was a wonderful way of situating what is so powerful about this piece, the way that it moves us into history and back from history into the present. 
um, through Douglas's life and through the life, the lives that we're all inhabiting now. So I wanted to kind of start with that and think for a bit, everyone, um, about the model of Douglas and this piece and what we can learn and what you do, Isaac, by situating Douglas across these screens. There's a way in which you immerse us in history as viewers and don't let us stand outside of it. You implicate us and what we are witnessing that I think is part of the brilliance of, of how you approach your obviously deeply researched subjects. So I don't know who would like to jump in first, but I'd love to begin talking about this and the themes that this piece is evoking. Um, you already mentioned oratory, Isaac, talking about um, his the Shakespearean elements that Fearon brings to the fore, but also photography, Douglas's fascination with photography, what he saw as its potential, and of course, um, among all of us here in different locations, the transatlantic nature of Douglas's life and work. So I don't know who is most anxious to say something, but I'd love to hear any thoughts you have knocking around your heads right now um, at this time after that great introduction and laying out of the scene. You have to unmute yourself, Warren. We want your words. Um, um, yeah, great. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that um, Isaac hasn't talked about is the sound of this installation, which is also so much a part of the immersive effect. And uh, uh, Paul uh, Gladstone Reed, the uh, composer of the, uh, not only the, the music, but uh, I believe also the sound effects, the various, um, the, um, I like uh, this term that uh, Isaac used, the oscillation. If, if the images themselves are oscillating here, the sound effects are also oscillating in, in different ways and constituting a, a kind of a multi-sensory experience that uh, both uh, operates by itself, I think, but also in relationship in tandem with the, you know, with this oscillation of the images uh, themselves. And so it's, I, I think it's very interesting to, uh, to go into, because I haven't seen the McAvoy uh, installation. It looks terrific and beautiful. I'm so happy that we were able to see those installation shots that were, were provided. Uh, we did see this work um, at the gallery in New York and, and at the Memorial Art Gallery in, in Rochester, New York. Um, and it, of course, it, the installation is uh, different at McAvoy, I, I would imagine, because of the size and, and scale of the space and, and so on. But I, I think the uh, sound um, creates another dynamic of this kind of uh, panoramic, horizontal uh, movement of the projected images that are in this amazing way, um, moving, fragmenting, reassembling across the 10 screens, but also constituting not uh, necessarily um, a um, disjuncture of images, but something that is really quite continuous in a way and that really uh, attracts our, our eye. I, I think we were thinking that this, in a sense, and I was just thinking this yesterday, we were talking and uh, I, I thought that this was a kind of interruption of the Cartesian way of looking and perhaps thinking. But then again, I, 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 this may also be a way of thinking itself that is quite Cartesian, not in a kind of linear uh, final way, but one that does provoke a certain kind of, of thought um, and also breaks up in a, in a way or presents us with a different way of, of trying to think about this question of perspective. And in, in a time in which we are so interpolated uh, as it were, um, in terms of perception and reception uh, by our own immersion in, uh, you know, the singularity of the, of the laptop screen, of the uh, large eight HD display that we can see glowing out of people's windows when we walk through neighborhoods, and also the commercial cinema, uh, which is, you know, 
which we don't get to see anymore, as, as a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> but which also sort of conditions the way that that we, uh, you know, perceive and receive uh, images and and their movement. And so I I'm I'm struck by that aspect of of, of Isaac's work and this particular work, um, as we go into space and we we see the images and I think as we saw the relationship of the of the installation the moving uh, image installation to the to the to the to the to the still images as it were uh, that accompany the the installation in in other galleries so I think this is worth trying to think about the, the sound uh, and uh, that immerses us in this that accompanies us on the journey of this installation and um, also the incredible way in which we are drawn into and moved uh, by, by the sound of, of this installation and the assemblage of different kinds of sounds, both orchestral sounds, technical sounds, uh, natural sounds that are brought together uh, in this work. Wow. There's, you know, there's a beautiful uh, comment in reference to what you're saying, Warren, by Carly Baker in the in the chat here that I, we're we're saving things for the end, but I just wanted to bring it up because she appreciates your talking about the sound because she talked about seeing it at the Rochester Memorial Art Gallery, um, Isaac, and she says that the that the room shook every time Douglas spoke, and that she was so mesmerized by the use of sound that she couldn't leave that she saw it twice till finally other people made her leave because they wanted to come in. So I think that's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, warrant to bring attention to the way in which Isaac uses sound. And um, I wonder, Isaac, if, if you think about sound in this haptic sense, um, or if that had to do with the architecture of the Memorial Art, <laughs> Art Museum. Well, I have to first of all say, you know, you know, that really in terms of um, you know, making this work. I mean, there are so many people involved in the making of this work. And I really have to take my hat off to Adam Finch, um, who is the editor of all my multiple screen works. And I could say my collaborator um, and friend in crime, so to speak, in terms of trying to exact um, a kind of um, sort of sound scenography for the works. And so um, I would say that um, in the work, you know, that Adam Trinch and I have been trying to um, develop over the last two decades, it's really been this question of, um, without sounding too pretentious, this Eisensteinian montage of attractions, where you're able to sort of use editing um, and to expand that sense of editing, um, the juxtaposition of in images that may be in Congress to one another, um, such as FBI footage, you know, Douglas speaking, and then fireworks, obviously going off representing 4th of July celebrations, along with this, um, you know, snooker of the ship boat, you know, and to oscillate all of these different images as a kind of poetics of attention. I take my hat off to Jennifer Gonzalez, who made that sort of, um, sort of remark in relationship to um, the way in which the montage sequences work and really to use sound as a sonic um, tapestry that sort of allows the audience to um, both have a particular attention made to particular, you know, images, but then at the same time to, um, if you like, the visual notation of the work follows a musical notation. Um, and that is something which I would say Adam Finch and I have been really very much interested in trying to develop as a, a form of storytelling, which can, if you like, um, that in fact it is the sound which coalesces the images and helps them to um, signify um, and to give the nuances to how you may look um, and view um, and, and the orchestration of all these with um, the sound dub um, by um, Carl, who I've worked with on 
um, various projects such as 10,000 Ways, all of this, there's really a lot of attention paid to it. It's actually very costly as well. <laughs> 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 Any sensible person wouldn't do it. In fact. Yes, well, we're glad you're not sensible, Isaac. <laughs> Always glad of that. Yeah. You know, the other thing that strikes me, I'm, I'm so preoccupied right now um, with the notion of intersectionality and how crucial it is for this current moment um, when we seem to be divided into narrower and narrower channels in our works, our communities, our lives. And the intersectionality that you incorporate into this piece and that Douglas did into his life is so striking to me. Um, both the comments you made at the beginning about his ties to the suffragist movement, but also in terms of his escape to Scotland, his two wives, um, one black, one white, the links to the Quakers, that there are um, this, there's this incredible movement. And I think it's so apt that you replicate that movement for us through a movement across screens. So I, I don't know, you know, what your thinking is, but it just seems to me that it's especially valuable right now, this example you're giving us here. Um, and the example that you're enabling Douglas to give us, um, to bring him, to rescue him from <laughs> that hideous uh, Trump reference that uh, Frederick, I hear Frederick Douglas is doing some good work. Wasn't that it? Um, <laughs> and, and to bring him to the foreground of our consciousness and, and of everyone's consciousness. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that in Kaz's article, in the Lawrence article, they do, you know, give attention to um, the form of the tableau vivant and the tableau being like a real central um, aesthetic motif, um, which I think is very interesting how, you know, um, you know, um, that um, Kaz and Warren homes in on that. And mm -hmm. I know that they've probably got, I'm sure Kaz has got some really incredible <laughs> <laughs> theories about that. <laughs> well, not, not theories, but um, <laughs> as I said, well, there's so much forward mo momentum in the work. And it's just, I mean, I'm always drawn to the tableau as a form because it's the oxymoronic nature of it still and moving and it slows it's contemplative, it's, it's a, a moment of opening, right? These are moments of opening. Um, they also pertain to the to framing. But I just wanna, I'll circle back to that, but I just wanna circle back to um, Warren's comments about in your elaboration of the sonic, because with the sonic, it's, it has, it's so much, you can be much more subtle, right? When you're using images, how do you subtly use images? And from the get-go, from the opening sequence, you know, you have a bird, a cuckoo bird or whatever, uh, dove lips walking through the autumnal forest. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, you hear very, very faintly um, the sound, it could be a helicopter, right? I, I, or a drone, it, it sounds like it's coming from our century, right? Mixed in, but it's very, very faint. And even the ambulatory walk through Douglas's home, um, you hear a creak. And one says, is that a creak on the stairs or is that the creak from the wood from someone being lynched as well? So it comes in, if you, if you listen for these moments, um, it's there, it's not just in this um, montage. And as, you know, as I was saying, you could run this work through, you know, five, the five different kinds of Isistania montage at first, you know, it's intellectual, sometimes it's parallel, it's tonal, and so far the, as the uh, sensuous aspects of it. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to point, to point that out. I mean, in the sequence that our guests have seen, we can talk about that. I mean, obviously you have the 4th of July, right? And then you have, it looks like tear gas on the protesters, right? A form of light, so that's comparison. But you also have the orchestrated parade-like movement from bodies and movement celebrating this 4th of July. And then you have this kind of evil drone reversed FBI footage that, I mean, I think it's interesting that you use, I mean, we could look at that as evil, as horrific, but we could always look at 
that as bodies in movement, right? For me, it's formation of a community. We don't have to look at, okay, it's evil, but it's also these black bodies in movement, right? Framed in a really horrific way, but there's something, something there's just one example from the, the piece that everyone saw. And as you know, the schooner going past, and as we talked about earlier, um, that demonstration, the Freddie Gray protester footage, um, occurred a few um, a few blocks away from when uh, Douglas lived in, in Baltimore. And I was listening to it again, and oh, so many, I mean, you've obviously extracted these key moments. He said, I watched, I looked, right? As I watched the votes go by. Or, or, so um, it is such an organic piece of work. I just can't underscore how nothing is superfluous in this work. Like there's something there and it's going to circle back and comment on something else. It's just, and it's, you know, it's part of the affordances in my view of multi-screen works or aesthetics, but you have to, I think one has to be careful, like to celebrate multi-screen aesthetics. Wow. That's cool. There's something else that beyond um, being wowed or feeling immersed or there's something such an add on in this particular instance with the combination of these works. I don't know. Oh, if that that's is. great. That is great, Kaz. That's so helpful. Um, now I've promised people that we're going to start taking up some of these questions from the audience and we've got wonderful comments and questions in the chat and in the Q and A. And, um, uh, some of them I think we may, maybe don't know the answer to, like is this installation coming to Toronto? <laughs> but uh, there's this great comment from Darcy Ballantyne saying that she loves the idea of photography as a, a reparative practice and as, um, as practice of reparation and wants to know if, if she heard you right, Isaac, if that's what you're talking about. And also invite uh, Warren and Kaz into this because the role of photography is so pivotal um, in your work and in Douglas's and in Douglas's life. So is that what you were saying, Isaac? Or do you want to expand on that? <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the reparational aesthetics, I think that Douglas was involved in, in terms of thinking about photography, was really mm -hmm. at the forefront of humanizing um, aspects which mm -hmm. he felt, you know, that this technology could bring as to those where you know, through the human hand, you know, caricature and stereotypical representations, but also, of course, that indeed this technology was a non-neutral technology, that in the hands of others, it could also indeed do the same stereotyping. And of course, I think that Douglas was aware of that, hence this very rigid, if you like, almost classical non-representational aspect to the back, you know, he didn't want anything to be manipulated in his portrait. Um, so I think um, the unison with JP Bohr in this is important. And I think, um, of course, the other rep repertory aesthetic that he was involved in was music. The fact that he, when he got very depressed, and this is all information that's really gleaned from the brilliant scholarship of Celeste Barnier, not myself, <laughs> you know, we were able to, um, you know, um, informed myself and the actor about the role and Paul Gladstone Reed, the composer, about the role of music. Um, the fact that when he's very depressed, he learnt the Scottish fiddle, you know, and the violin, you know, that his son was one of the early black um, musicians in a classical white orchestra um, that, um, you know, the role of, so I think, you know, these repertory aesthetics, you know, these are things which one tries to um, utilize in the work and to mm -hmm. kind of rearticulate um, in the, the film um, installation itself. 
Uh, there's um, M Emily Barton asks about the, this uh, sensuous and somatic encounter with history and wonders about talking about that in the space. And Kate McKay says that she's interested in the way you foreground photography and abolition and that Sojourner Truth sold photographs of herself to fund her activism and the way in which photography played a role in that time. And I'm just going to quote you back to yourselves, Kaz and Warren, because you say in your essay, for Douglas, photography alone could not subvert the habits of racist viewing that was so ingrained. However, believing it could have a propitious role in rendering the African-American subjectivity and consciousness, Douglas advocated that human dignity depended upon recognition and thus conjoined the ideals of justice with racial uplift and with photography. So I think there's a really rich conversation there around his use of photography and your use of photography, Isaac and what Kaz and Warren have had to say about it. I think it it's, continues to be fertile ground, especially if we think about it today and the way in which the iPhone has replaced the camera as a vehicle. And what does that mean? What does photography mean? In what register does it appear today? I mean, I think, you know, it, it tells us who points the camera, um, you know, the means of production, um, this is really important, you know, um, and, you know, we know that, you know, the role of iPhones um, and where they have, in a sense, created um, in a very sort of uncanny sense, this humanizing aspect, um, the whole involvement of Black Lives Matter, the way in which younger white um, people, you know, who are indeed our future, along with younger black people and lots of people of color that, you know, all together that these communities are aware, you know, of its role um, and organize around it. Um, as do, of course, you know, our <laughs> people on the right. <laughs> yes. They know it, you know, it too. So it is, yeah. I don't romanticize it too much. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think what's um, you know also interesting is I mean there's lots of things that that we can say about Douglas and photography and it's uh, in the piece we try to capture some of the tremendous scholarship that that's come out in the in the in the in the end notes there on on photography. Uh, and, and Douglas in particular, 19th century photog photographers. The, I mean, the history of 19th century photography and, and African-American photographers is really so in, incredible. And this uh, Lessons of the Hour does open us up to that history and uh, provokes us to want to not only think about it, but to, to, to learn more, to become more aware um, so many uh, scholars are now writing on these questions and we're beginning to learn more and more. But one of the things that is, I think, quite subtextual to, to Douglas's engagement with photography is also his opposition to the way it was used against, uh, uh, against, uh, uh, against Black people uh, in the, in the mid-19th century with ethnology and the use of photography to uh, um, to uh, create this, uh, invent this sense of difference uh, that uh, that the that the African uh, the African slave was some uh, closer to the animal and not quite human, and of course uh, some of the uh, scholarship on photography has turned to those early uh, uh, ethnographic and ethnological photographs of. Uh, of slaves that were meant to do this kind of work. And Douglas was really quite aware of this and spoke uh, in his speeches uh, quite emphatically uh, that those series of three or four speeches that he wrote in the uh, 1860s on photography really was speaking back uh, to and against the, you know, the representational force of photography to a world um, uh, you know, the, the African person and to engage in this kind of dehumanizing work photographically as evidence of, of difference. And I think this is part of the it, Douglas's engagement with photography and his attempt 
uh, through his own body and his own uh, portraiture to, to speak back and to turn, to use photography otherwise and in a different kind of, of way. Um, and this may have this may have been naive at the moment that we tried to say because you know it, he, but I think Douglas was aware of this. And I think this is what makes him such an amazing figure is his awareness that he's, you know, he understands, you know, the contradictions in which he is working. And yet he he works them anyway. And I think Isaac's work captures this, uh, you know, through you know the very nature, the very architecture of this work. You know, opens us up to consider both, you know, the you know the, the way Douglas is thinking, and also the tensions that are involved in that thinking as well. And of course, we see this in in the very present. You know, the the contradictory nature of the image we of working with photography. There's so many beautiful photographers working right now, uh, African American photographers, African photographers. Photography is such an important issue, and and yet uh, in many ways. We are continuing to uh, straddle the the problematic, same problematic that Douglas was was engaging in in the 19th century, in the in the 21st century, in many ways. Yeah, um, I since you talk made that last little reference to the 21st century, I wanted to um, just insert here a slide because. Um, uh, this year on the anniversary of this Frederick Douglass speech on July 5th in Rochester, there was this vandalism of a uh, Douglass statue. And um, it's not the original statue, but here you can see what's happened to it. And um, this was over 4th of July weekend. And uh, it coincides with the destruction of Confederate statues. Somebody in Rochester, some forces, some people, tore off the statue of Frederick Douglass and dumped him against a fence um, off uh, some, some 50 feet away near a gorge, um, bringing the violence of that, that Douglass had avoided in his life, bringing that violence right here. And this was not the original historic statue. Uh, this was a replica. There were a bunch of replicas that were put up um, in Rochester. Um, I think around the same time you were first shooting this, Isaac, uh, in 2018, the 200th um, anniversary of Douglass's birth, um, the, there was a group called Re-Energizing the Legacy of Frederick Douglass. And they made these replicas, I think 12 or 13 of them, and put them up all around Rochester to really emblematize for people the fact that Douglass had indeed lived there for many years of his life and to claim him as a kind of native son. And I know, Warren, you lived in Rochester also yourself for a number of years, did you not? <laughs> out, out you as a former Rochesterite. And I just wonder, you know, how that felt as you were working on this piece, Isaac, to have this kind of I've smashed back into the present um, with, with this vandalism. Yes, I mean, I met the artist, um... I think it's um, Carver who actually um, instigated this public art project of mm -hmm. these um, replicas of Douglas be placed in the city, and mm -hmm. it's a very popular project. And it was done, you know, in um, in around the sort of anniversary of Douglas, and it was a very popular project. But there had been an incident, an in incident where this had happened when we were actually um, involved um, in our research. Uh -huh. I think the way in which this question of, you know, monument, because of course, when I went to Highland Park with John Hanhart and um, Jonathan Binstock, um, director of the Moral Art Gallery, who commissioned the piece in 2016, and I saw this amazing kind of um, monument of um, Frederick Douglass, I mean, I sort of couldn't believe it, to be frank, and it was next to Goethe, um, which had been um, where something similar had happened to that monument, in fact, you know. So, and I think there's a way in which um, this question of moralization, and of course the way in which that became like a huge subject um, this year, um, due to the fact of um, the dethroning of 
monuments um, which represent a particular history, which of course, in a sense, Douglas is just a rare example of um, representing a certain kind of history which um, is not ordinarily represented. Um, you know, and of course, Douglas in his time had lots to say about this. He was there at the unveiling of the Lincoln um, statue um, and the speech that he gave then was incredible because it was very critical of the Lincoln Memorial statue. Huh. At the same time, um, he recognized you know, its signification, but he gave quite a damning speech. Um, it's incredible foresight, really, into the debate that we have now, um, where the statue in Bristol um, that was tumbled, where um, the protesters now are facing court summons um, in relationship to that action. Um, and I think the debate continues um, in this respect. Uh, how do we memorialize the past? I like to think of Less of the Hour as being a kind of anti-monument to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all your work is, all your work is, Isaac. Yeah, but I should, you know, I mean, I thought, I thought it was incredible when I read <laughs> the notice um, after the, this art, st this st public artwork had been um, dethroned where Carvin replied and said, well, we have, you know, lots and lots more that we can replace them with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, he, he you know. Uh, <laughs> Oh my. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, Carvin, Carvin Ice in, in those years I spent in Rochester. He and I were classmates in Rochester. And so we, you know, we know each other quite well. So it's quite remarkable, these <laughs> kinds of connections that have been made. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We have a lot of other comments and questions here in the chat and in the Q&A. And um, very funny comment from Lewis Watts saying about, about how much he appreciates that you made tintypes during the production, Isaac, and that uh, Frederick Douglass was so knowledgeable about the power of photography. And he, he says he would have been all over social media. Actually, he was. So <laughs> what do you, I don't know what you think about that, but I thought that was a great comment. Great, great comment. Um, also, there's a lot of questions about how you do your pieces, how you cast them, how you bring this together. Um, I have questions. I mean, also, you got to shoot and film again for this, did you not? Um, with Nina Kelgren, who shot, originally shot Looking for Langston way back when, right? Yeah, I did, you know, and um, we shot on film and we shot on 35 millimeter film because, of course, Rochester is also the home of Kodak. Um, and we wanted to revive that relationship between analog technologies and digital technologies. And shooting on film then became very important. But of course, working with Nina, Calgrin and um, how she photographed amazingly looking for Langston with this relationship between the still and moving image between photography and the, and the cinematic. It felt really important to bring all the people who were involved in looking for Langston to make this work and to try to focus the attention between the photographic and the cinematic, which I think Nina does so incredibly well in terms of lighting and framing, etc. And I think there's a way in which, um, yeah, there was a way we were able to home all of these aspects into the work. I think it's also part of what gives it this vividness that we're, we're not that used anymore to seeing that kind of clarity of image. Uh, there's another interesting question in the Q&A from Peter Stein saying, there's a lot of imagery in the installation of Douglas and his wife on the train. And can you comment on the connections between mobility and movement and race that you considered in making these scenes? And I would open that up to all of you if you want to talk about the train at this time and you know um, what that means and what that has to do with the issues that you're talking about. Well, I know Kaz has some really interesting ideas around waiting, you know, the representation of waiting in that scenario and um, the way in which um, any of those plays a role um, 
in those moments mm -hmm. uh, between technology Cass? and movement. Um, framing, we'll get back to waiting because that's part of the synergy between the piece. Of course, the go-to is Shovova, Shovova, she wrote a whole entire book about the train. Um, and this also ties in with, right, as a kind of emblem of 19th century a signifier of movement, mobility, change, and and of course the train did change um, the way we see it, the way we travel. It, you know, it did it did change life um, in the nineteenth century. Some folks the beginning of modernity, et cetera, et cetera. But that is even that is even implicated in. Um, he said something about to the effect just off the top of my head that it creates its relationship to vision and. When you look out the window, I mean, there's a kind of panoramic view, I think, something to that effect. But this, I mean, that, this is why I think the tableau is important and the different rhythms of the work in so far as the amount of time on the screen. We have all these images of progression, you know, um, sewing machines juxtaposed with, with um, train wheels, etc. cetera, um, because he's, he celebrated progress, but it's, it's at times there's a sense of putting the brakes on in this work. And, he, and I'm sure Douglas would stop, right? Thinking about, I mean, it's very important, the progress of, 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 of the black race, et cetera, with, you know, in, in, you know, embroiled with modernity and abolition, et cetera. But the images of the, of the women, I would say, um, Douglas's first wife, um, and, and waiting, right? Is waiting is a kind of labor, um, but that adds, along with the tableau, Yvonne's, a sense of stillness. Otherwise, it, you know, it could be, it could be like, it would be Eisensteinian if you just focused on progress. You had to break that up, and it's done to great effect. And so subtle, that's what's another thing I just can't, uh, underscore enough is the subtlety of this web of associations. And the more you read about Douglas or the more you watch it, you see these subtle associations. I don't know if it's that helpful enough for thinking about the relationship between progress, movement, and the stilled image. That in, I didn't know that if they were playing that with that throughout. I mean, that's, it's, it's quite evident. I didn't know that the relationship between photography and the cinematic. And indeed, the, you know, we have kind of um, Edison-like, you know, there's um, travelogues that were made in the 19th century where you harness the camera to the beginning of the train. I get that, that's inserted subtly, but also, in the opening, we'll call it a sequence, movement. We don't try not to fob these cinematic words onto installation works. Um, the insertion of the Oscar Micheaux's answer to Birth of a Nation, to have two shots from within our gates, the very beginning. I mean, um, do you have any response to that? It just works so well. How did you come across think that? It's just perfect. Well, there's always an archival relationship to making projects, and in a way, um, Oscar Michaud's work. I mean, he's the filmmaker that really, you know, is at the forefront um, in this moment of um, the birth of cinema, where basically there are representations. And I think this idea of the point of view mm -hmm. makes those images. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's important in the point of view, and so. Um, it's really just a little nod to him um, mm -hmm. and the work that he did um, and involving the idea of spectatorship um, and black spectatorship in particular, um, which I feel is embodied um, in his works and choice framings and the way in which he... Um, and, the, you know, of course, that image is a very pertinent image and, you know, we had... You know, uh, you know, we had to. Tr Adam Finch, you know, editor who I work with, and I, we, you know, and Mark Nash and my high school team, when we are editing the studio, you know, we all look at these various um, moments and, 
we discuss it as a, as a huge discussion point, um, how these are inserted or not, you know, and how they work. Yeah. Isaac, you're kind of creating yourself as a sort of conductor with the orchestras at your disposal. <laughs> that I think is, I think it's time for you to do an opera. I think it's time for you to do an opera next. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we're really out of time. Do people want to make any final statements? We're, we're at our end, our announced end time. And I know people, um, not us, of course, other people are on tight schedules. Um, any last thoughts you want to leave people with, anyone? Well, I, I just had a, um, just kind of an idea um, the, around the question of progress and modernity. And the, there's so many interesting effects in the installation with the uh, sewing machine sounds and the train sounds. But I was reading in, from one of the historians mentions that at the end of the 19th century, the, the phonograph is coming into being. And Frederick Douglass was aware of the, the phono, phonograph. And we don't really have a recording of his voice. Uh, so this is, struck me as very interesting in the, in the, the installation as a, both something that gives us this realistic sense of Douglass, but also we recognize that it's a reenactment. And so I was just wondering in the absence of a kind of recording of Douglas's voice, and, but the fact that Douglas was aware of the coming of the photograph and was very interested in the photograph and very much wanted to have his voice recorded, uh, you know, what, what Isaac thinks about not having Douglas's voice as a recorded artifact or in the archive and how that absence played into the way that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the actor uh, performed Douglas in the in the installation. Yeah, but I think all of that is very much connected to um, the inner workings of the performance and the actor and Roy Ferron's work with um, a coach. You know, he worked um, for a month on a, with a speech coach. Um, very meticulous um, in that kind of method, Shakespearean manner, you know, to enact um, that kind of language, of, obviously due, due to his training. And also, I think the conversations with Celeste Barnier as well. But we also did look at lots of different films where we saw Douglas um, perform and I think, yeah, I mean, and then just, yeah, I think sort of like, you know, there's an interpretation, a creative interpretation, does that work? But of course, you know, no, we don't have his recording of his voice. You know, we have many examples where people have read his texts um, by quite famous actors. Um, but I think it's really about then, you know, that visceral, um, relationship that you want to capture and you know so um, I think all actors who you know all good actors you don't tell them what to do they kind of into, they know what to do <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it speaks to your casting, your gift for casting Isaac, which was a question Patty Zimmerman had posted up earlier that um, you're the I one making these choices, aren't you? And, you know, What's that? I have an amazing casting agent who um, has also um, worked on some of the Queen's films um, and he's very special um, when you work with him, you know, he, yeah. So there's also that. Yeah, good. I think this may be a good place to stop. We're a few minutes over, but well worth it. Thank you all. This has been just such a wonderful gathering with people I've known, it seems, forever and who've known each other. And uh, really great of you to come together for this and for us to have had this wonderful audience as well. Thanks, everyone. Lots of thanks coming by in the chat. And I've also just posted um, the link to uh, Kaz and Warren's article so that it's freely available for anyone who wants to see their complete unpacking 
of this work with wonderfully uh, meticulous intelligence. Thank you, Isaac, for taking time out to talk with us. And uh, thanks to the McAvoy Gallery um, for, you know, bringing this work and bringing us all together. Thanks to Film Quarterly and the crew there. Thanks to all of you for coming.